Welcome in. I'm Brian Fisher with D1 Ticker and D1 Extra. Pleased to be joined now by a good friend and a good colleague, uh, Stuart Mandel, the editor in chief of the college football section of The Athletic. And Stuart, uh, we just got off the uh, uh, off the wires now uh, with college football playoff expansion. It's on hold again. The commissioner's deciding uh, that they will meet again in January. No progress uh, necessarily has been made. No decision, I guess, has been made. Uh, what were your instant reaction, I guess, from the news out of Dallas? You're never totally surprised when the commissioners do nothing. Uh, they're very good at that. Uh, but it feels like the clock is ticking and it feels like this is all just an unnecessary standoff. Um, it's clearly the Alliance conferences are digging in their heels. They don't want the SEC to dictate what this thing looks like. Um, but the notion that where where if they don't do something soon we're basically just gonna stay where we are and through the end of the contract because the sec is not going to suddenly change its mind and go for an eight team playoff um with automatic qualifiers and i certainly don't think the um any of the other conferences would would support a system with no automatic qualifier so here we are we're in a stalemate and um, I would think, you know, if they don't make that decision in January, then all of this was for naught. Well, thinking back, obviously, you know, there, there was a lot of press surrounding this decision to announce this initially and say, Hey, we're going, we're gung ho about playoff expansion. I mean, in retrospect, it seems like that was the, the biggest issue surrounding the entire, uh, ha happenings with this is that. They, they announced something that was not ready to go. And obviously things have changed. There has been new commissioners. Oklahoma and Texas have moved to the SEC. But uh, it, it's almost like they thought their ducks were in a row, but that wasn't the case at all. It was, it's been a completely botched uh, process. Not necessarily what the working group did. I, I mean, I think part of the problem is that it's gone on for so long. This working group with Greg Sankey and Bob Bullsby and Jack Swarbrook and Craig Thompson was formed I believe, early 2019. And since then, the ACC, the Big, 20, Big Ten, and the Pac-12 all got new commissioners who hadn't necessarily uh, signed off on that process. And they're looking at it going, ho, ho, slow down, slow down. I know you spent two years on this, but um, we'd like to have a say. So, I, you know, in hindsight, I, I'm sure the CFP wishes they hadn't uh, held a press conference and unveiled in great detail this proposal for a 12-team playoff, even though they always did warn, not so much that it wouldn't get approved, but that it might not get, it might not be able to start sooner than 2026. And that's really, to me, um, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, an 18 playoff with automatic qualifiers is just not going to happen. So it's, are you willing to um, blow up the contract and start this early? Or are we just going to let it play out? And it sure seems like the Alliance commissioners feel like it's not make or break, that they can afford to wait a few more years. Well, you mentioned afford. I mean, there's been a number of reports saying that this this deal could be worth up to $450 million on top of what they're already getting per year if they do end up expanding a few years early. Uh, how, how does George Klyovkov, how does uh, you know the, the rest of the Alliance go back to their ADs and especially given uh, some of the purse strings that were a little bit tighter uh, coming out of the COVID era, how do they go back to their, their ADs and the presidents and say, you know what, that, that extra five or $10 million a year, it, it's not going to be coming in 2024. Well, I think that uh, at least Klyovkov and Kevin Warren who come from, you know, outside the college sports sphere, think that it makes better business to wait until ESPN no longer has first right of refute. Because right now, I believe, from what I understand, all they could do is, you know, ESPN is going to have those seven bowls, New Year's Six in the championship, it, through the end of the contract regardless, whether those New Year's Six games become quarterfinals or not. The only thing they can really open up to bidders is if they're adding four new games at the, at the beginning. Um, I think those two commissioners want to wait until... The contract is up and they can put the whole thing out for bid and NBC and CBS and Fox and everybody. And I'm to your answer your question, they're telling their ADs, sit tight. I know it would be very tempting to get more money now, but if we play the long game, we're going to make way more money in the future. And so now the question is, are they really prepared to, to, to do that, to take that short-term hit? I, it, the one that really baffles me is the ACC. 
because their deal with ESPN is so one-sided. Um, they desperately need this new playoff money to help close the gap that is going to, you know, rapidly escalate between them and the other power five conferences. And, um, to me of the three, they can't, they're the ones that can't afford to wait. Well, the good news is for Jim Phillips, at least he, he got that new Comcast distribution deal coming in. So there's at least a bit of a stopgap measure for the ACC. But yeah. But I think I, in the grand scheme of things, that's, I mean, that's good for the conference, but I don't know how much revenue that actually generates. Speaking nationally, you, you've been around this game through the changes. You've written books about uh, the changeover from the BCS and whatnot and, and how we even got to this point where we're talking about a 12-team playoff. If, if you step back, how much can a 12-teamer uh, playoff really invest in and in, uh, in a little bit of life into this, this sport nationally? Well, the funny thing is the, the problem that they were trying to find a solution for uh, which was that it's getting stale that the same four or five teams are making it every year um, has not really transpired this particular season. I mean, we are, you know, one week, one uh, weekend's results away from possibly having a playoff with no Clemson, no Alabama, no Oklahoma, no Ohio state and no Notre Dame. A couple of them could still make it, but there is a possibility of none of them. And, uh, but you still have no pac 12 and, and, I think that's a big factor. I think um, Greg Sankey himself has come out and said it's not healthy for the sport to have that whole part of the country be excluded. There, um, you know, at least before realignment, uh, there was a lot of increased sympathy for the group of five and that they should have a seat at the table and they should have access. Obviously, all of those conferences except the Mountain West really got watered down through realignment. Um, so you know, it would fundamentally change the sport. Um, but I think everybody agrees that it's something that needs to be done. Um, it, I don't think you have to go from four to 12 necessarily and skip right past eight. The problem is that eight, eight doesn't solve what, what we were just talking about. I mean, there, if you went back and applied in the 18 playoff to, you know, the last four or five seasons, all that would do is get more Georgia and more Oklahoma and more Ohio state. Cause they're usually the teams that just miss. So, you know, I get it. I get the, the appeal of 12 and that every, and literally everybody, you know, Utah could be playing for a spot in the playoff this weekend, Wake Forest and Pitt could be playing for a spot in the playoff this weekend. And it, it opens up, um, it makes more games meaningful. It reduces the individual stakes of a game. But I do think that if you watch the rivalry games this past weekend, and all the emotion from Michigan and Michigan fans after that doesn't go away. If to me, that doesn't go away. Even if both teams know they're going to the playoff. You mentioned this weekend, obviously a, a huge weekend, not only in terms of the, the rivalry games, but also coaching carousel. And, you know, on your podcast, the audible, you, you mentioned that this insane coaching carousel has been great for business, certainly for the athletic and, and other outlets out there been great for content. That's, that's for sure. But, you're not sure it was great for college football. I was wondering if you could maybe expound upon that because I'm sure LSU fans would disagree a little bit. I know USC fans would disagree a little bit, but well, what do you mean by the coaching carousel has actually kind of harmed the sport uh, the last couple of days? We have one coach, Brian Kelly, who ditched his team days before possibly being selected to play in the college football playoff. He, he on Sunday said at a press conference, or maybe Saturday, I'm not sure which, but after they played Stanford, this is absolutely one of the four best teams we deserve a chance to play. And, but I'm not going to stick around for it. Um, somebody's offering me a lot of money. And then in the case of Lincoln Riley, um, it's not so much that he changed jobs, you know, coaches change jobs, but because of the transfer portal, um, early signing day, Oklahoma's whole program is imploding, uh, as we speak, because he's taking half the staff. He's, you know, probably going to, He's already um, gotten a, a commitment from a five-star QB who was ha had been committed to him at Oklahoma. I wouldn't be surprised if some Oklahoma players transfer and follow him there. So um, the, the combination of so many different factors, right? I think realignment is a factor in, these, in some of these decisions. You heard Brian Kelly today say that one of the reasons he wanted to go to LSU was to be, under the, to be on Broadway, to be under the big lights. That's his acknowledgement that in the new – paradigm of college football, the SEC is the place to be, even more so than Notre Dame. Um, 
you know, I think Lincoln Riley looked at the landscape and thinks he has a better chance to win a national title at USC than as one of five or six blue bloods now in the expanded SEC. So all this chaos. Um, and then the, well, not even to mention the money figures and look, college football coaching salaries have been inflated for a long time, but I think they reached an inflection point this year when, when Mel Tucker, that was the big one to me. Mel Tucker has not really proven much at Michigan state yet. I do think he's a good coach and they, but two crazy boosters, right? They have the, they have the money to do it. And he's now making the same salary as three time NBA world champion Steve Kerr. That's not, uh, yeah. it's just not normal. Something it's, it's the sign of a market that's completely messed up. And unfortunately, um, no easy way to put the genie back in the bottle. I, I mean, is there a possibility maybe that this just is a circumstance driven thing, a blip, if you will, because of the, you know, LSU and USC, that those are jobs that typically do not come open. They're, they're two top five jobs. I think everybody would agree uh, coming open at the same time, firing their coaches so early in the cycle uh, you know, I mean, several Trojans uh, administrators kind of admitted that they didn't know if Lincoln Riley would be the head coach in Los Angeles uh, had they had the Sooners won Bedlam. So was, right. it, was this maybe a bit of a blip? Could we see a return to normalcy in the future? Or is, is this this kind of hiring and firing cycle just uh, here to stay? I think that if you're a school that is looking at this all play out, you would absolutely follow the same model. It worked. Fire. I, I was skeptical that firing their coaches early would give them any sort of heads up in the coaching carousel market. And then they ended up making two, you know, amazing hires. And the reason this is all happening so fast, obviously, is early signing day. That's the one that's maybe the one concrete thing that may need to be reversed. You know, I know I agreed with it at the time for simply recruiting reasons. It makes sense kids to go ahead and sign and get get it over with but the effect it's having on coaching where i mean you had um you know texas tech fired their coach and hired away another team in the conference as assistant coach in the middle of the season um everybody so, yeah they're so desperate to get get this lined up uh in time for early signing day so if you got rid of early signing day you would at least alleviate some of that pressure to, to do this stuff in the middle of the season. You you wrote about Lincoln Riley and how important that hire is, not just for USC, but for the Pac-12 in general. And we mentioned the ACC and how important playoff expansion might be for that league. The Pac-12 missing out on, on the CFP for the fifth year in a row. It, it does feel like, though, there's some wind in the sails. George, they have a new commissioner. George Klyovkov has come in. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the there's been a big focus on USC. Washington has changed over their coaches. Um, is, is this maybe an, an inflection point for the league right now, kind of similar to going back to with the Big Ten and, and when Ar Urban Meyer came in at Ohio State? Is that is something similar happening out west right now? It was, I can't emphasize enough what a huge win that was for the Pac-12 as a whole, because it's just been a really dark time for that conference in football for the last five years, not just missing the playoff, you know, losing, increasingly seeing the top recruits on the West Coast, uh, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, uh, Spencer Rattler, like, you know, I'm, I'm focused on quarterbacks, it's other positions as well. These guys that in the past would have gone to a Pac-12 school are leaving to go to the SEC or to Ohio State. And the, and the trends seem to be accelerating. And now USC hires Lincoln Riley and suddenly kids are going back uh, to the West Coast, at least for their school. So just in terms of the stigma that has been following Pac-12 football lately, this was a big shot in the arm to say this is a big concrete step toward reversing that. Now, the other schools, I mean, you know, uh, Washington State had to fire a coach who wouldn't who wouldn't get vaccinated. Washington thought they had, you know, they had Chris Peterson's handpicked successor and he flamed out after 13 games. The rest of the conference is in pretty rough shape right now. And they, you know, they I think Washington made a good hire in Kalen DeBoer, but he's not going to come in with the Lincoln Riley cachet to just dramatically turn things around. So on the whole, it's probably going to take a few years at least for the Pac-12 to get this thing turned around. But the Lincoln Riley hire has, I feel, a ripple effect for the rest of the conference.
it, it does seem like we're we're in a, a, a seemingly new cycle that does not stop right now. We it feels like uh, especially between playoff expansion, college football realignment, we have this NCAA constitutional convention. Uh, you know, things are not slowing down; they're speeding up. And I, you've been around the game on the national scene for, for a couple decades now. I, I'm curious: have, have you ever been in a moment like this? Do you think we'll, we'll even slow down in terms of the amount of changes that are happening to the sport? Yeah, no, there's never been this much change at once. Uh, certainly the, the 2010, 2011 realignment cycles were very hectic. And, um, there was also a lot of, uh, if you recall around that same time, a lot of NCA scandals, you know, the Miami, Nevin Shapiro, Jim Trestle. So those, those were two, I mean, those were two years where I remember feeling like I had no off season, much like this year, but what we're talking about this year is more fundamental changes to college sports as we all have always known it. And whether it was NIL, uh, you know, you mentioned that constitutional convention that's come that, you know, some, whatever's going to come out of that. Um, it just, it just feels like the whole thing's shifting under, our, under, under our feet, uh, in real time. And, um, the good news is, you know, rivalry weekend was a great reminder that no matter what's going on off the field, the on field is still to me, there's nothing better, uh, in sports and, and, People, you know, you put that stuff aside once the teams go out on the field, but the business of college sports just changing at a, at a mind numbing scale. Well, hopefully we will have time to uh, to, to rest our heads and, and uh, take a break and, and hopefully take a vacation. But uh, thank you so much for joining us, Stuart, and uh, we, we appreciate your thoughts. Thanks for having me, Brian.